<laughs> this, is, this is great. I feel like uh, this is awesome. Amazing. Amazing. So um, I want to... I want to thank all of you. you uh, this is really um, an amazing, amazing group of people. Um, I've had fun meeting some of you today, re-engaging uh, a lot of former patients. And um, I just want to say thank you especially to Lori, uh, Debbie, uh, Nancy for opening up her home to us. Um, uh, my sister is over there, Melinda. She helped out because uh, some, some last minute changes and things like that, but uh, really thank you to all of you guys because uh, I, I always tell people I'm the luckiest surgeon in the world because I have the most fascinating patients and um, you guys have something really, really special here with the Surface Hippie group. I, I've never ever seen any group so committed, enthusiastic and motivated to uh, do well and to, to spread the word. So you're, you guys really are amazing. So I, I feel very lucky to be part of it. And thank you for inviting me. Um, so um, <clears throat> I put together a totally new talk. And uh, it's entitled Hip Resurfacing, Everything You Wanted To and Maybe You Didn't Want To Know. It's about 45 minutes. So um, if we have time and we get through it, um, we'll take questions at the end. But um, if, uh, if you guys start nodding off, I'll, I'll cut it short. Because I, I, could, I, could, I could keep going all day. So. Um, <clears throat> I have, I have a consulting arrangement with Smith & Nephew. I think uh, you, you all are aware that they manufacture the Birmingham hip resurfacing, so uh, they do um, pay me to train other surgeons for the Birmingham, and uh, they've supported some research. So obviously that's a disclosure that I want you all to realize. Um, of course, uh, we, we need to remember why we're all here. And as much as all of you are motivated, passionate, and enthusiastic, uh, Vicky was even more so. And, and all of you know that, and I certainly don't have to remind you of that. But she was an amazing woman. And um, it's, it's really shocking how quickly things have changed. And uh, it's a really big loss that we're feeling. And uh, I, I wouldn't have met a lot of you if it weren't for you, for, for her, and uh, certainly I don't think there would be gatherings like this, and she was an incredible organizer, so I hope that that continues. And She really was a, a true champion of hip resurfacing. Um, she could talk about hip resurfacing with surgeons all day and loved it and did it day and night, and, and she was really, really amazing, so she's sorely missed. Okay, so um, when I put this talk together, I wanted to do it in dedication of Vicky, so I really wanted it to be complete, and uh, I apologize if it, it's redundant for some of you who have already had surgery, but I wanted to kind of go from the beginning to the end and, and you know, take questions and address everything. So I want to make sure we address these questions. You know, a lot of people ask, if you haven't had surgery, when should I have surgery? What type of surgery should I have? Why don't all surgeons perform hip resurfacing? Uh, hip resurfacing versus total hip replacement. What's the history, the benefits, the risks, and what are the results? Uh, what about women in resurfacing? So, um, you know, that's been in the media recently, and I want to make sure we spend some time on that. And, of course, talk about some of the negative press that's happened recently. And what's, what's in store for the future? So a lot of, lot of ground to cover. So we should be able to get through all of that. <clears throat> Uh, so the hip joint is an amazing joint. It's, it's my favorite joint. And uh, it's, it's really, you know, our, our evolution of understanding has, has gone from um, <clears throat> thinking that it's just a simple ball and socket to realizing it's not just a ball and socket with bone and cartilage, but it's got the labrum, it's got the ligaments, you have all the muscles around it. It's capable of tremendous motion, and we rely on it for a lot of a lot of activities. So, um, you know, that's kind of on the on the left. There is a normal joint, um, and an arthritic joint, as we all know, um, happens when the cartilage wears out. So, why does the cartilage wear out? Uh, on an X-ray, an X-ray is really the first thing to start with in evaluating the hip joint. Here on the left, you can see a normally formed hip joint with a cartilage space between the ball and the socket. And when that goes bad, you develop bone spurs, you have bone-on-bone -bone contact, and you see uh, limitations from those spurs that form. Your body recognizes that it's an abnormal situation. It tries to stabilize the joint, and it creates blockages to movement to try to make it stiff, basically. And that's what happens. In a lot of people experience stiffness. 
Um, <clears throat> causes of arthritis, I think we all realize it's multifactorial. It's not only uh, our genetics, but it's our activity, our weight. And it's also a mechanical relationship of the ball and the socket. So it's altered anatomy having to do with the shape of bones. I think we realize now that probably 80% of arthritis stems from mechanical alterations in the joints, such as femoroacetabular impingement, which is the most common cause in males, and dysplasia, which is a shallow hip socket, which is the most common cause in females. Childhood disorders such as leg calve perthes, slip capital femoral epiphysis make up the rest of those. Of course, trauma can be an, uh, an inciting event, damage to the joint, whether it's fracture that causes misalignment of the joint or uh, actually direct <coughs> cartilage damage, and also avascular necrosis. So these are all the things that make up the spectrum of the reasons why people have arthritis. <clears throat> So you could see here with altered anatomy, here on the left is what we would call an aspherical head. The ball is not round anymore. And basically, instead of having a round ball, you have that. And on the, on the right here is dysplasia, where the socket is too shallow. And it doesn't cover the ball. So you get edge loading and abnormal cartilage wear. So it's like having a tire out of alignment. I've said that over and over. But if you have a mechanical uh, problem and things don't line up properly, you're going to have a bald tread sooner or later. And the, the quicker you do it, the, the more miles you put on it, the harder your activity level, the quicker that's going to happen. So the treatment options for arthritis, I think, uh, unfortunately, end-stage arthritis is a mechanical problem. We don't have the ability to regrow or restore cartilage yet. That's the holy grail. One day, perhaps, we'll be able to inject materials at an earlier stage and restore that cartilage. But since a lot of it is mechanical, the misshapen bones, that all has to be corrected before something like a cartilage uh, restoration work. <coughs> so arthroplasty is a generic uh, term to uh, refer to um, changing the joint, reshaping it to create a new joint. So arthroplasty or replacement corrects this. And it can be in the form of hip replacement or resurfacing. Um, and when should you have surgery? That's a question I've heard over and over again today. It's, it's, there's no set answer for that, and it's a difficult decision. So um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's different for everybody because people have different tolerances. Obviously, common symptoms are pain, stiffness in the hip joint, a limp when you walk, difficulty getting in and out of a car, difficulty getting in and out of bed, putting on your shoes and socks, an inability to exercise. And um, the more active you are, the more I think it impacts your quality of life in terms of what you want to be able to do. So, you know, people used to wait until they couldn't walk one block and they would be limping and say, okay, now it's time to have my hip done. Now people do it when they can't walk 18 holes, when they can't play two sets of tennis. And it's a different, it's a different lifestyle these days. So in, in some way, it has to impact your quality of life on a daily basis, and then I would say it's time to think about it. <clears throat> what can you expect after surgery, whether it's hip replacement or hip resurfacing? I would say 99% of people say it's a miraculous operation. It is a really wonderful thing that has been created, and uh, you can have pain-free function on the day of surgery. People are walking the same day of surgery with less pain than they had before surgery you will eventually have improved range of motion. We remove the bone spurs. We get rid of that bone-on-bone -bone contact. You may approach that of a normal hip, but re range of motion is a complex interplay of your muscles, your tendons, your bone, impingement, and uh, things like that. So it may, not it may not be equal to your totally normal hip, but I'd say it's 90% of what you could expect. Um, you will expect an increased activity level and definitely an improved quality of life. So it's really a wonderful thing um, that changes people's lives.